know, I was you know, interested in politics from the days back at Wabash College when I was a biology major that switched to a political science major, ended up getting a practical econ degree, and you know, thought I'd go to med school and be a surgeon someday, and didn't have that amount of time and further training. Uh, segued to law school, business school, and was headed to Vanderbilt, and I didn't even have four years in me. So I went to business school. Uh, my wife and I then traveled east and lived out uh, there for two years and made the unusual decision to uh, uh, move back to our hometown. And uh, after getting highly degreed, I didn't even know where my diplomas were until we found them in a box about four years ago. And so I led that Main Street life. And believe me, uh, in building a business, when you're competing against larger companies, the institutional competitors, and watching politics as it evolved, uh, like my wife said, Mike, you're talking to yourself over on the couch. Uh, and that means <laughs> <laughs> you're frustrated. And I think that's how President Trump got elected. It was cumulative frustration with institutions not seeming to work. So I get here, and um, probably the only senator on the Agriculture Committee that's actually involved with farming. Uh, Deb Fisher's got a cattle farm, but um, most of what I bring to the Senate, when I decided to move back home, I got involved in things, uh, took on the health insurance companies 11 years ago because I was fed up with, you're lucky it's only going up 5 to 10 percent this year. And instead of just doing something mildly like you normally do to fix things, I radically changed it and wanted to make it consumer driven. Uh, wanted transparency, and believe me, in a paternalistic system like healthcare has been delivered, that was a radical idea. I had a, several employees, you know, really question what I was doing, and by getting them to have a little skin in the game, grabbing the transparency that was even out there then, even though the pro providers didn't want to give it to you, not had a premium increase now going into the tenth year. And we actually lowered family health care premiums by, I think it was 1400 bucks a year back in January of 18. And I don't think there's another CEO in the country that could say they did that. And it was just like running for Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, I was frustrated. I really believe, now that I'm here, a ton of smart people, uh, almost none of them, though, have done things in the real world. They've not done a budget. They've not done a payroll. They've not competed in a way to where you really learn how things work. Mm -hmm. So uh, agriculture, infrastructure, health care, I've actually done those things. And those are three pretty big agenda items here. Can anything get done this year? You've authored uh, a number of uh, pieces of legislation on drug pricing. Uh, the last couple of weeks, there's got a lot of attention on the grassley widen bill. Um, the administration has attracted headlines. It withdrew its, its rule. You know, the 2020 election, we're already talking about it uh, intensely. Can anything actually get done? And, and don't, do you think if anything can get done, it has to get done real soon? It does, because in anything, you've got a time frame. Uh, building a business, did it over 37 years. I really probably wouldn't have started out competing in that arena uh -huh. if I didn't think I was going to hit pay dirt eventually. Well, it was 37 years, and I still had seven, after 17 years, just 15 employees. So I tell everyone, once you're successful, they always want to know, how did you do it? Well, it's not the diplomas. It was hard work, perseverance, um, and you've got to have good ideas, and you've got to have a sense for which fork in the road to take. Here. It's so politically charged, and the benefit of being a state legislator for three years, and when I mentioned infrastructure, in Indiana, we're the crossroads of America. We were not spending money to be the crossroads of America, our comparative advantage. And we were sliding backwards, and I'll never forget, I was on Ways and Means and Roads and Transportation. And this would kind of be a metaphor for how government should work. Uh, First of all, I'm a fiscal conservative, and the only way you're going to pay for roads and bridges is basically two things now, uh, your user fee, your gas and diesel tax, or tolling. Well, even in Hoosierland, 
70% of voters want better infrastructure. 70% don't want their taxes or fees to go up. So you got that element. But we actually did something back in 2017, made the hard decision. We've got a stream of cash flow, doing it from a balanced budget and a cash reserve that's going to put us in the catbird seat. And I'm already weighing in on EPW to take some of the principles that I learned there. And that's don't always ask the higher authority to pay for everything you want. That's uh -huh. typical in the stratification of government. Uh, and I introduced a bill, it's called a Regional Development Authority Bill, where we as a local entity can put skin in the game to initiate a project and help pay for it. Well, we've been talking about that for 40 years back in southern Indiana. We've got it teed up and we're running with it. That's the speed of light. Here, it's the opposite. Uh, the executive calendar has pretty well occupied all the floor time. Um, things. In, in Indiana, in the state legislature, I can now see we move quickly. Here, it's the opposite, and the institutions are more dug in. Uh, all the folks that try to bend your ear and give you campaign checks are uh, twice as um, strident as they were there, so we're not going to get a lot done. Uh, I'm hoping, and as I've talked to my friends on the other side of the aisle, finally getting their attention on health care is, hey, you should be for transparency competition taking on the industry. And I've told CEOs of the health care companies, you're that thick-headed, you got the president, you got the uh, Senate, you got the House, you've got Democrats, you got Republicans, all saying you're giving us a bad deal. You ought to be fixing it yourself, or I always say you'll have a business partner, uh, uh, of Bernie Sanders with a much different approach and you won't like that. And I, I think that we don't have a lot of time, but no, I'm in an institution that's got its rules and its lethargy and all of that and that's frustrating, but I knew that before I got here. You worked with our fire speaker, Senator uh, Baldwin, on yes. legislation on drug pricing. And has that been unusual? I mean, you, you don't see a lot of bipartisanship going on right now. I think so, and I think it's part of life where um, in building my business, uh, I always uh, formed a relationship with my competitors in some way. Mm -hmm. They knew I was going to be their worst nightmare in terms of trying to get to the finish line first, but I never did believe you should have that kind of caustic you know, relationship because I think you don't, uh, you can't make your case as well. So with, I remember it was in budget committee, I think, and Chris Van Hollen, uh, actually had an amendment. I was sitting next to Governor Rick Scott, who I've kind of teamed up with on our side as being one that wants to fix the system. I said, Rick, that looks like it could be one of our amendments. And it was funny, and this is how D.C. works. So chair of the budget committee, Mike Enzi, it pretty well like that in the state. If it was a Democratic amendment, there was no questions asked, you just voted no. And the opposite. So four Republicans did that. And I said, Rick, I'm going to you know, speak about the fact that this is a good amendment. And it was funny. Did that. The next four Republicans, including Chairman Enzi, voted for it. And I smiled and told Chris, I said, is this the beginning of something? I think it could be. We should all be interested in lowering health care costs. And we should all know that it's the industry, mostly through health insurance, that was a finance plan that was innocuous back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was a fringe benefit that me as a CEO never worried about it because it was probably 5 to 6% of our GDP, right. not 18 to 20. And you didn't have that. You're lucky it's only going up 5 to 10% each year. So, yes, uh, Senator Baldwin and I did that. There were 67 senators that weighed in to the lower health care cost bill that Chairman Alexander and uh, Patty Murray uh -huh. have uh, shepherded through. And I wish it was a little more aggressive, but I've been here long enough to know it's pretty good. Uh -huh. And it ought to be sending a message to the industry, wake up, you do not have a lot of time. And the other reason is you always hear folks saying, well, I love my insurance if it's through an employer. Well, that's the employee because the employer 
generally pays for 85 to 100 percent of that plan. No skin in the game. The healthcare consumer has atrophied, whether it's through government paid for insurance or employer provided, to where they're not an aggressive shopper, but it's been concocted by mostly the health insurance industry to keep it opaque, you know, have these behind the scene deals. You can only benefit if you in a network, all of that needs to change. Um, speaking of change, you, I mean, you ran as an outsider. You were a big underdog in the Republican primary. And big. Winning, yeah. winning easily. Um, what does the Republican Party have to do? President Trump says he wants to make the Republican Party the party of health care. Look at polls. That is not the case right now. Well, in graphic example, I'm out there on the stump, and we got the lawsuit going yeah. out there. When I did that back in 2008, I covered pre-existing conditions and no cap on coverage before the law really required it. I'm a believer that you should never go broke because you get sick or have a bad accident. That's a promise I wanted to make to my employees. I never had any beef with the foundation of Obamacare other than it was doomed to fail because it was big health care, specifically health insurance, in cahoots with big government. Where have you seen your phone bill go down over the years or wherever industries get concentrated or they're regulated, they, it generally is not a good uh, conclusion for the consumer. So uh, I was interested in creating a dynamic that was going to change that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're on the cusp of something because uh, there is more bipartisan interest in it now. And uh, the Finance Committee just uh, shoved through a bill that's actually a, a, uh, aggressive. We as Republicans. Do you like that bill? I do. Okay. And, First of all, we cannot be apologists for an industry that's not part of free enterprise. I mean, it's more like a utility in the way it operates because there's no transparency. You're at the grocery store. You have shoppers with their phone out trying to save a dollar on a $4 item. I know in my hometown people would drive 60 miles to save 50 bucks on a $1,000 big screen TV. We have none of that. I found it back in 2008, and that's what's created a system that would work. Republicans are always behind Democrats when it comes to acknowledging an issue. Uh, issues like climate change, like income inequality. You know, I believe those are all valid things for discussion, and we need to find a way that doesn't bring us in at the last minute uh -huh. to where you don't have credibility and to where on the campaign trail most people said how can you say what you're saying well it was the truth number one but you're a Republican and it looks like all you're trying to do is get rid of covering pre-existing conditions get rid of Obamacare right. because of the lawsuit that's still out there I wish that would go away uh -huh. that makes it difficult for us to make our point and a lot of colleagues on the Republican side also I imagine say that behind closed doors. Well, they ought to say it uh, out front. <laughs> right, right. Um, you have called on with other senators uh, in letters and publicly to, on the drug companies to lower their drug prices. Have, have you heard back? Any feedback from the drug companies? Here's an interesting story. Eli Lilly, um, one of the biggest companies in Indiana, if not the biggest. David Ricks is the CEO, chairman of the board. Um, met with him for the first of four times about a year ago. Interesting conversation. He was telling me all the attributes of Big Pharma. Okay. And really, we will lose in a one-payer system or to where there's components of the healthcare system, and that's my mantra. Fix yourselves, shrink yourselves, distill yourselves down into where we keep the best of what you've got, and we discover most of the procedures and cures here because of our system, because it's got enough capitalism there. But then where it gets screwed up is once they come up with these great uh, cures, uh -huh. then they hand it over to a distribution system that has PBMs. Right. That's a 180 to $300 billion worth of nonsense. That's where pharma writes a check to a middleman to help price the product. That's done in all other industries by transparency and having the heavy lifting done by consumers. That's why I wanted to, was glad that they had the ruling to get rid of PBMs 
in the sense of giving them the check. That check needs to go to the pharmacy so you really get the discounts to patients. Of course, there's the lobby. And then you got the CBO that was obtuse in how they scored it, uh, only taking the government impact where you might have higher Medicare premiums. That could be part of it. You'll save four to five times that much at the pharmacy level and the consumer level. And that's part of the frustration. So uh, David Ricks, after the fourth meeting, said, Mike, I know I was kind of dragging my feet. You were right. We need to be out front. And that's why when the PBM thing came out, I called him and said, can I use your name as one of the you know, thought leaders in pharma that you're for getting rid of PBMs? And I was surprised he said yes. Uh, Not enough of David Ricks out there. There has been some concern raised by Republican leaders about grassley Wyden. The Senate is leading on this. We are going to see, supposedly, we're going to see a bill in the House yeah. uh, this fall. Uh, that, I imagine, is going to be more of a, a partisan bill than a bipartisan bill, I would imagine. Um, but do you think Republican leaders will actually schedule a floor vote on drug pricing this year? Need to. Otherwise, we're going to get back into the old uh, perception uh, that we're not interested in doing anything. And I don't think we have a ton of time. Uh, we need to get, um, we need to tackle the insurance component too. They don't want to do that this year because that is the glue that holds this opaque system together that gets managed at the boardroom level where users of the system can't see anything. Uh -huh. So, and then there are a lot of Republicans now, they're saying, well, this sounds like price setting. Right. This industry is more like a utility than it is selling auto and truck accessories or RV parts and accessories where you got competition everywhere. We all sell at the same low price, and the only way you stay in business is you keep your overhead low or you've got good intangibles like customer service. This industry is the opposite. It's got super high overheads, lacks the transparency, Therefore, I tell my Republican colleagues, you need to look at this more as a utility. I'm as free market as any senator there, but most industries have evolved to where they're not as competitive and transparent as Main Street competition is. Big corporations try to do what big corporations do. Concentrate in industry, less competition, more opaque. Mm -hmm. And the healthcare industry is that on steroids. Mm -hmm. When you go home, drug pricing, where does it rank on the, the number of top issues? Uh, I imagine more people talking about it than maybe the Mueller report? Yeah, I'd say so, back <laughs> right. where I'm from. Right. Right. And I think yesterday would have been an indication why we need to you know, set that aside. Um, and uh, most people from the heartland are sincerely interested in, I think, the three big issues when I ran, health care. Uh, Republicans are foot draggers on it, right. disappointed with it. Uh, border security would be another thing. I'm a believer that we need more people coming into the country. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, there are tons of jobs that we just can't fill when it comes to visas coming to all the things in terms of what we need with legal immigration. We need it enhanced, but we're caught in that dilemma now. Uh, so border security, getting you know the immigration system fixed, um, healthcare, and this was the thing that disturbed me most, and this is what ought to disturb most people. Worried about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and they need to be worried. Uh, but in what way are they worried? That it won't be there. Uh -huh. And even the people that are in the system, and they, and they ought to be, because I'm a finance guy. You never would run this place like it's run with a 20% loss every year, and then by, I, know, I know there's not any banker I am aware of that would lend you money. You, you'd do things differently. And here you can see with the budget deal. You know, we're still, uh, and it's a, there's always something in the present that makes the midterm and the long-term point of view difficult to start implementing. I never care about the short run. And most CEOs that are smart know that whatever's happening today is going to be different in five years. And if you're not a forward thinker, embracing change, you're not going to fix things. And of course, that's what's at play here in the way the institution works. So uh, I think that when it comes to any of the things we're doing, there's an urgency to it. 
because the folks back home aren't even appreciating the economy. And, and getting back to what they are worried about, that's mm -hmm. always number one. Mm -hmm. And not, I think we're at the sweet spot of revenue generation and what was done with the Jobs and Tax Act because I can feel it on Main Street. It's really helped Main Street more than Wall Street and big companies and corporations because they were in a different world than where we come from anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm raising wages, bettering my health care plan, because I think I see the economy, since we're keeping more resources at the entity level, and I wasn't seeing the ROI when I was paying 40% of the federal government through my entities. Uh, I wanted to keep more because I think that we can do more there. So health care, border security, worried about entitlements, and like I say, Medicare goes broke. We completely deplete the Medicare trust fund in 2026, Social Security in about 2034. And then it'll be the elderly in their retirement, in their health care, and poorer people through Medicaid that will feel the brunt of the next major reconciliation that occurs. And I, that's, that'd be a travesty. We have a few minutes left, so we're going to open it up for questions. If uh, you can wait for a microphone, and then I just identify yourself because uh, we're live streaming on thehill.com. Hey, how are you? Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Jared Gould. I'm working on the Hill now. I've been involved with uh, healthcare for some time as a heart health advocate, um, representing two different organizations. When it comes to the drug crisis and all these high costs with health care, what is the legislature trying to do on the front end rather than the back end? The back end being these drugs cost a lot of money. The front end being what are we going to do to make sure that Americans don't have to be on these drugs? Well, when I took on the whole remediation process in my own business, we need to go to emphasizing wellness and paying for it rather than fixing things after you're sick. Uh, that's why I did start health savings accounts. Um, you get penalized in our plan if you still smoke or you don't take a free biometric screening. And that's probably anywhere from 200 to 250 bucks. And I've got 1,000 employees now. I had 300 back when I did it. So two things need to occur. The consumer employee has to buy into his or her own well-being Get your biometric screening. In our area, it's um, diabetes that would be where we're going to spend a lot of money. But now that we're uh, stressing awareness, you know, own, buy into your own well-being, we've got a lot of people that are fixing that before they're on insulin. So when I mentioned earlier, paternalistic, the most important thing in your life should be your health. And, you know, education is right in there along with it. Ironically, the two most expensive things that go up each year, uh, post-secondary education needs to be uh, redone, just like health care. I've got more, I think, technology, and I see that happening. Plus, I think parents are finally seeing that we're not going to pay the bill for degrees that don't have a market. Getting back to health care, consumer-driven, buy into your own well-being. Companies, where everybody loves their health care, have to start shifting some incentive to where employees just don't remediate, to where they have some skin in the game from dollar one like I created, but we may be too far down the trail because when you grow up with a system where you've never had to be a consumer, when the only time you see what the heck it costs is when you look at your statement that doesn't make sense right. and you see all these discounts that were done behind the scenes it needs to change. That's why I don't think we have a large window. And here's the other reason. Employers do not like the employer provided insurance because they pay for all of it and they're stuck with the bill and not many CEOs had the nerve to do what I did to make it consumer driven and build a sustainable system. The industry is digging in like it shouldn't be digging in because if I were them, I'd be embracing all this stuff, just like I see in the climate arena, where the energy companies are actually changing their ways by investing in solar and wind power 
You know, they're not doggedly hanging on the fossil fuels because of what I said earlier. Embrace change and do it in a way like I've done it where you still build a business based upon adapting. We have run out of time. Please thank uh, Senator Braun for joining us this morning. And I'll hand it back. Thank you. Hey.